fun stuff. And these are one of the integrated circuits that is a great, a great one for us. So um, let's talk about them. Operational amplifiers. The operational amplifier is an extremely useful device. It amplifies, um, and so it's an active element that requires an external power supply. Okay. So usually when you power an op amp, so you need to have a pow an external power supply, so it's going to be uh, an active source element, but it's, um, there are differential power supplies, and then, so it has the plus and the minus, so if you have like, you'd have to give a plus and a minus 12 volts to it. That is typical for an op amp. Um, it typically needs the differential, the plus and the minus um, power source. Uh, op amps use the concept of feedback in which the device's output is fed back to its input. And the guy who came up with this, I believe he was at Bell Labs. Um, he came up with it, and people thought he was crazy for a little while, I think. And it was one of those, like, nobody really thought this was a cool thing. And then it ended up, like, taking over the world. Um, so these are a really great invention, but it wasn't immediately obvious to people that it was. So uh, op amps are usually complex integrated circuits made of transistors and other electronic elements. They're inexpensive, like they're pennies. Okay, so they're like very inexpensive. And if you order them in bulk, if you order a hundred thousand of them, then you get them for very small pennies. So they're very, very inexpensive. Um, we use the symbol this to denote an op amp circuit. Um, as we have here, we nearly always suppress the op amp's power supply in the diagram. So these are not the power supply terminals. We're showing three terminals here, but these we are not showing the two power supply terminals. The two power supply terminals, every once in a while, in a circuit diagram, we will show them, and we would show them coming in and out like this. Okay. Uh, often we suppress that those two terminals, the two power supplies. That okay. keep us from getting confused when we're making our diagrams. Yeah, it's. It's just assume that the this is going to have an external power, a known external power supply attached to it. Right. Exactly, exactly. And, and if you want to explicitly call that out in your circuit diagram, then you should put those in and show what power it's supplied to it. But oftentimes we'll leave it off. Um, it just simplifies the circuit diagram. Otherwise it gets a little messy. Um, we call the negative sign terminal here the inverting terminal and the plus symbol denoted terminal, the non-inverting terminal. Um, sometimes we just say plus and minus, but it's better form not to because uh, we oftentimes will have a power supply connected to it and very often our plus uh, terminal, our, our non-inverting terminal is going to be connected to the ground, as one of the example that we're going to look at will have. And so the plus and minus get kind of confusing, and people make mistakes when you use that terminology. So it's best to say the inverting and the non-inverting terminals. OK. So basic operations. Let's label the voltage at the non-inverting terminal to be V plus, the voltage at the inverting terminal to be V minus, and the voltage at the output of the op amp, this is the output of the op amp, to be V O, okay? Then, the, the uh, equation that describes how 
this op amp operates is k times v plus minus v minus, where k is called the open loop gain. The open loop gain can be uh, very, very large. Depends on the op amp, but I mean it can be 100,000, 200,000. So very large gains typically for the open loop gain. Um, the notice that in this in this circuit we don't have any feedback. That's we haven't closed this loop, but we are going to almost always have a fed back terminal. Um, so one of these, either the plus or the minus terminal, will have. Uh, some feedback from this output terminal and usually we will have a um, some circuit element a resistor or a capacitor for instance um, in that feedback loop um, there are lots of different types of interesting circuits you can build with this and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that so for for dynamic analyses we will use this equation to describe uh, the output voltage, okay? And uh, there are static analyses as well, and so we're going to kind of, I'll try to, I'll try to carefully delineate those two, um, and uh, hopefully there's some, an emerging understanding that, that comes. So. The operating rules that we're going to cover here um, are the ones that um, uh, Horowitz and Hill describe in The Art of Electronics. I think that these are very good operating rules, and it's a very good first pass. When you look at a circuit that has an op amp in it, this is a good first pass. Uh, if you have dynamic responses, though, at, in this class we're often focused on that aspect, and you want to d describe the dynamics of the system, then this, these operating rules are not enough to get you all the way there, but they'll give you an intuition, and we're going to use this equation to help us out. So, um, so let's get into them. So we can get an excellent idea of how an op amp works by approximating its operation with the following two rules. So rule one is that the op amp attempts to adjust its output which is being fed back, remember, such that the voltage difference between its input terminals is zero. Okay? So it tries to adjust its output so that the, the V plus minus V minus is zero. So it's trying to make this difference zero right here. And that's it's making V out be whatever it thinks it needs to be in order to do that. Now, I'm using, I'm sort of anthropomorphizing it, and that's a very common thing to do. Um, anthropomorphizing, yeah. Is that where, like, the, like, people become animals on the book cover? Like, uh, it's, it's when you attribute uh, human sort of qualities to something that is not human. So you can anthropomorphize an animal, um, like if your dog is like you endow it with these human um, sort of qualities. Uh, but you can also anthropomorphize anything, including a circuit, mm -hmm. like this one. Um, so it's very common to think of it. And there are, I don't remember if Horowitz and Hill talk about it. The thing that they do talk about, like a, like a dude being in there, like adjusting the output to try to make the inputs zero. So like they're very commonly, there's like some, some uh, the way that people think about op amps is that they have like somebody in there trying to change the output to make the input difference zero. Uh, it's okay to think that way. I don't know if I, I don't really like anthropomorphizing too much. It's, it seems like it. Yeah, I mean it can be. It, it's it's useful to a point, but then we have to be careful to to uh, not overdo it. Um, to recognize that it's, it has only limited value. As long as we do that, we're fine. Rule two is that the op amp draws from its inputs very little current, which we approximate to be zero. So we want to, so what this 
you know, this op amp's trying to do is make the difference in these voltages zero, and it also draws very little current from these. So what that means is if it's drawing very little current, it's hardly affecting the circuit on this left-hand side, right? It's hardly drawing any current. It's sort of like when you connect a voltmeter, a multimeter to a circuit, it draws very little current, and we say that it has a very is it high or low input impedance, the, the multimeter. Mm. The voltage? It would be low impedance, wouldn't it? It'd be high for voltage. So high, yeah. So if you're measuring so if you're measuring voltage uh, with a voltmeter, you have hopefully a very high impedance so that you're not flowing very much current through it. And that is the same uh, sort of sort of device that an op amp has for its inputs. Um, you don't draw very much current, therefore it has a very high input impedance. Okay, that's what we say about an op amp. It's a very high input impedance. However, its output impedance, um, we will see, is very, is very low. So that's, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the lab, I believe. Um, so, uh, we approximate the current draw to be zero, and so you can actually do some basic circuit analysis and get an intuition for how these things are going to operate in the circuit just using this, um, these principles. So let's do that. So the inverting amplifier is our first example, and we want to know what the output voltage is given some input voltage, okay? So this is a way to make an amplifier, okay? It's a very simple amplifier circuit. So we want to know the ratio of the output voltage to the input voltage. So solution, from rule one, we know that V minus is equal to V plus, or approximately so, right? Because we're assuming, we have this feedback, so we're assuming that this output voltage is such that we're pretty good at getting these two voltages pretty close. So we're going to say these are approximately equal to each other and that they're equal to zero. Okay? Um, why are we saying that V plus and V minus are equal to zero? Um, we said that they're almost equal to each other, but why does it have to be equal to zero? It isn't really implied. I should probably change that. So I'm going to say not that part from rule one. That is also true. Furthermore, V minus equals V plus equals zero. This information comes not from rule one, but from the circuit itself. How did I recognize that. Where is zero voltage in our circuit? Uh, ground. ground. V plus terminal is connected oh. to ground, right? Yeah. Therefore, so therefore, since V minus terminal is approximately equal to V plus, they're all equal to approximately zero. Okay. So that's what rule one gives us and a look at the circuit that recognizes that we've connected the plus terminal to ground. Um, so from those two insights, therefore, uh, we can say that VI, VI, which is our input voltage, equals VR1. And, and how did we recognize that VI is equal to VR1? Hmm. Well. This is approximately ground then, right? Yeah. So VI is the source. And VI, you know, we, we wrote it like this. We drew it like this. But we know that we could also think of this as being plus, minus. And this is connected to ground, right? So that means that this is pretty much ground. It's pretty much like VI is a voltage source going through 
R1 to ground. Right, therefore, they have to be equal opposite. Right, because that means that this, this node is actually approximately that node, right? Under the assumptions we've made. And so we have this fact here. And on the other side of the op amp, we can say something about what V out is. V out is the voltage out. Now we could draw, is there's an implied ground here, right? For V out. And so this is ground and this once again is approximately ground. So V out is also equal to the voltage across R2. V out is equal to the voltage across R2. Okay. From rule two, we're saying that the current draw from this side on the minus, in the inverting and non-inverting terminals is zero, right? So if we write a continuity equation, um, so I'll do it here. So from rule, so there's no current draw. So therefore, the contour, which I already drew in for us, let's look at this node here, the contour there. So therefore, the contour gives the continuity equation. So we have, going into that node, we have IR1, right? Uh, we have IR2. And then we have, we didn't, we didn't do an arrow. We should do an arrow for I minus. So we say minus I minus equals zero. But we also are assuming that I minus is zero, right? So that implies that IR1 is equal to negative IR2. Okay? Is that pretty clear to everyone? I mean, these rules seem a little strange in a certain sense, and it, you kind of what it kind of makes you wonder: like, is this thing gonna even do anything? Like, is it gonna do? And and you're not the first person to feel that way. Um, this is not it, it's not straightforward. Um, it's not obvious, I guess, why this works by just looking at it, but it does work. Uh, once you go through the analysis, if you assume these rules, we're going to find that we can actually amplify signals with this. Um, it's very strange at first, but eventually, I think you can get kind of a little bit of an a little bit of an intuition for them. But it, it does take time. It's one of the more non-intuitive uh, aspects of this course, I think op amps. People struggle with the intuition on it. And that's, you know, that's, uh, it's okay to struggle with intuition on things. It just makes your mind strong. Mm -hmm. Like a steel trap. Just to be cliche. <clears throat> it's better, if you're going to be cliche, to be self-aware of it. <laughs> right? Right? It's less cliche. Or is it? But, but being self-aware that it might be cliche to be self-aware about it being cliche. Now that, that's not cliche. It is. If you get meta enough, you're no longer cliche.
And then, yeah. By the way, Logic Comics is still going great. <laughs> Loving that book. Still so good. Bertrand Russell is a really interesting guy. So the, the theme that this book is actually trying to argue for, um, a lot of these logicians went, went crazy, went, actually had uh, like psychosis develop later on in life, uh, sometimes earlier on in life too. And there have been some people who have said that it's because um, logic makes you go crazy. Like trying to deal with these really, really strange paradoxes in logic makes you go crazy. And there is, I, I think that there might be an element of truth to that. Uh, but this book is actually arguing the opposite. That, that being, um, having a sort of, I guess, psych, psychotic, uh, maybe streak in you draws you to logic. Um, and it makes you want to try to control the world or control ideas through logic. It's really interesting. That makes sense. Yeah, I, I actually a stabilizing force. Yeah, they're like they're looking for some way to 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 uh, organize the world in a way that that is is uh, maybe stable and on solid foundations. So it's really interesting. I I'm finding this book great, and it's also a really easy to read. But it keeps me up late because I'll just like be like, oh, okay, another chapter. little yeah chapter. But this chapter is like forty pages, so How long is this it's like three hundred pages. Are you going crazy? No, not. Really. <laughs> <laughs> um, just been reading. <laughs> the seed, the seed of of my craziness uh, was already there, so it's just giving me an outlet. <laughs> so. People yeah, stuff, speaking of that's, elements, that's really we should finish this example. So the elemental equations for the resistors are VR1 equals IR1 times R1. Same old elemental equations that we know and love for resistors. VR2 is IR2 times R2. Now, Using these with the continuity equation, we can make the following couple of statements. So we know that IR1 is equal to negative IR2. If we use this as our starting equation, we plug in IR1 from the elemental equation here and IR2 from this elemental equation, we get that VR1 over R1 so that's IR1 being equal to VR1 over R1 equals negative VR2 over R2. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, VR1 from up here we said was equal to V in. VR2 is equal to V out. So we have V in over R1 equals negative V out over R2, which solving for the ratio of output over input, which is what we wanted to find in this problem, V out over V in is equal to negative R2 over R1. And this is going to be the, so it's not just the answer to the problem. Why do we want to know this? We wanted to know this because the output voltage over the input voltage is the gain, right? The actual gain of this op amp. It's not the, it's not the um, uh, open loop gain. It's the, it's the gain when we have feedback. And it's R2 over R1. So if you choose R2 over R1 to be right. large, really then it's large. Exactly. So that is our first example of how to analyze a circuit with an op-amp in it. And we're going to do another example next time.
okay? But it's going to be dynamic next time. Okay.